Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you. I am very, very glad you're here today. Of those that are joining by live stream, we're glad you're here too. And we want to welcome all of our visitors. And week after week, we see new faces. And we hope that our church members will be reaching out to those new faces, letting those folks know they are welcome. We're glad that you're here. I'm glad to have my daughter from Brooklyn, New York here visiting with us for a few days. And so that's always a very special, precious time. Also want to let you know that our mission team made it to Guatemala and they are where they're needed to be and they are going to be very active over the next couple of weeks, oh, not a couple of weeks, but about a week or so, a little longer than a week, trying to build two houses. And uh, so it's going to be a whirlwind for them. We want to pray for their protection and strength as they do this ministry there and helping these families and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. That's what it's all about. So thank you again for your generous gifts that made their trip possible. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to begin at verse 17. We are going through this book, amazing book, dealing with a troubled church that had issues, and in one sense, I suppose that's a good thing because we learn from their issues, and Paul is addressing a whole host of issues that the church was struggling with. And at some points in his letter, he gets very direct. And he makes some pretty strong statements. And he says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and he says, here's how it should be done. So we come to a place where churches uh, do it in various places of the world. They do church one way, and some places they do church another way. It's not so much that as the attitude behind it and are we doing it with the right motive and are we doing it to exalt Christ? Are we doing it just to build our own personal little kingdom down here? So Paul in writing, he says, you've got a problem we need to address. In verse 17, he says, but in the following instructions... I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Now, that is a shocking statement to me. Paul says, as a church, it would be better for you not to come together. Now, you think about that. Paul is saying, you guys shouldn't get together. He says, <laughs> when you get together, it's not for the better, you get together, and it's for the worse. Now, that's not the way it should be. Shouldn't church be a safe place? Okay, two of you agree with me. Thank you. But I believe it should be a safe place. I believe it ought to be a place. How many of you think you ought to leave here feeling encouraged? Okay. How many think you ought to leave here sometimes feeling convicted? Yeah, that might be a healthy thing. How many of you think that the church ought to be a family? We have the same Father. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same Word of God. We have the same destiny. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. So church ought to, when it comes together, it ought to be for the better, not for the worse. But Paul says, concerning what I'm hearing when you come together, especially when you come together for communion, he says, you, you're got, you've got it wrong, and you're hurting yourself, and you're hurting others, and you're really damaging your testimony. It would be better off for you not to get together than it would be for you to get together like you're getting together, and it is not good. Well, that's pretty direct. That's pretty forceful. But Paul the Apostle loves this church, and he tells them that over and over, that he loves them. And sometimes a parent who loves his child will do what? 
will confront them. Why? Because he loves them. He wants them to be blessed. He wants them to rise to a higher level. And you want them to be responsible. So Paul is giving some really deep instructions here. And so he says, when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Verse 18, he says, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Well, of course he believes it. He's already talked about it in chapter 1 and chapter 2. They had little personality cults going on. People were saying, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Peter, or I'm of Christ. You know, they had all these little, little groups, their favorite preacher that they followed, whatever. And that was creating division. But he says, when you come to your celebration of Christ's sacrifice, he says, you are harming the church. Now, communion ought to be a time when we come together. It ought to be a real spiritual experience. It ought to be a good experience. It ought to be something that unites us. But in Corinth, it was dividing. You say, well, how, how did that happen? Well, here's what was going on. In the early church, they would get together for what they called the agape feast. The word agape is a Greek word. It just simply means love. It was supposedly, of all the words for love in the Greek language, agape was the highest form of selfless love. When the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that is the word agape. He so loved. It was beyond agape. It was magnificent. And so he says you're coming together for a love feast. Now there's a little bit of a copycat going on here because the pagans did that in their worship of the pagan gods. They would all get together and have these feasts in reference to their pagan god or goddess. So here we're seeing that they are coming together and they're having what they called a love feast. Well, that's a nice name. The only problem is that it was misnamed. It shouldn't have been called a love feast for what they were doing. You say, well, what was happening? Well, Paul's going to get into that, and he's going to explain why this was causing divisions among the church. Verse 19, he says, For there must be factions. Factions among you. Now, the word factions there is the Greek word schismata. Now, we get our word schism. In the Greek language, schismata means to rip or to tear. So here Paul is saying, for there must be factions among you. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you're trying to get rid of these factions, and yet now you're saying, for there must be factions. That doesn't make sense. Why this kind of language? Well, he says, here's why there are factions among you and why this must be so among you. Now, it's not necessarily so among all the churches, but among Corinth, there, God allowed these factions for a reason. There was a reason, not that he caused it, but he was going to use it. So how was God going to use these factions, the schismata in the church? Notice he says in verse 19, for there must be factions among you in order because that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Did you get that? He says there are factions and schisms in order that the real might be distinguished from the false. That the real might be shown to be real by how they respond, and the false are going to be shown to be false by how, by how, by how, they, <laughs> by how they respond. Now, the schismata. God was saying, you can tell 
When there is a schism, you can tell the true believer from the false believer. How? Because the true believer, when there's a schism, is praying, is seeking to be a peacemaker, is wanting Christ to be exalted, is wanting the church's name to be protected. It is not wanting to drag the testimony of the Lord through the mud of the world. People who love Jesus are trying to bring healing. The false, how, uh, however, have their own personal agendas, and they are demanding their rights their way, and you can see them in meetings getting angry and mad and using names and pointing fingers in an attempt to state their case, make their agenda, and have their way. Paul says you can tell just go to the meetings where they're discussing issues and you'll be able to tell real quick who has the Spirit of Christ and who doesn't. And so God allows sometimes issues to arise in order to separate sheep from goats, wheat from tares, those who have the Spirit of Christ from those who don't. And so this is what Paul says. Let me read it again. Get a hold of this. There must be factions among you in order, in order, that those who are genuine among you might be recognized. There have been people that I love to be around. They are people of peace. They're people of love. They're people who are seeking to unite, not divide. They are people who really try to walk in the Spirit of Christ. When you're around them, you feel the love of Christ. When you're around them, you feel their inner peace. When you're around them, you desire to be around them because they're not a threat. They're not out charging some hill, waving some flag, you know. They are <clears throat> really imitating a love for the sheep, a love for the brethren. You see, John said in his first gospel, not his first gospel, but his first letter in 1 John, he says, if you say you're a child of God, but you don't display love toward your brother, then how does the love of God reside in you? You see, the point he's making is, is that if God is a God of love, and he is, Scripture tells us that, and we are his followers and we are filled with his spirit, which is the spirit of love, how is it that we can act in an ungodly manner toward one another? John and both John and Paul says that doesn't compute. So here Paul is trying to tell us that one of the things that characterizes the people of God is that they are people of peace. Now, it doesn't mean from time to time we might not have to pull a brother or sister aside and privately in love, speaking the truth in love, tell them that they, they need to handle an issue differently, not to be so vociferous, not to be so schismata, that they need to be a person who is willing to Yes, I have a different opinion, but I operate out of love. I am not going to divide the church just so I can have my way. So Paul is saying here, there must be factions that those who are genuine among you, genuine, the word genuine means, well, you know what it means, the real deal, the real article. You can look up, uh, you know, and you can look at it, a diamond, and you can say, yep, that's a real diamond versus one that's made out of paste or something. That's the real deal. Verse 20, he says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Well, that's strange. That's what they were calling it, the Lord's Supper. Is it not the Lord's Supper that you eat? Now, here's where he gets real pointed. He says, For eating... Each one of you goes ahead with his own meal, and one goes hungry, and another gets drunk. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. 
See, the agape feast would be, was supposed to be like our potluck. Now, I've been to a, <laughs> a lot of potlucks, and sometimes I didn't have too good a luck. But anyway, I've been to a lot of those potlucks. Fortunately, First Baptist ladies here know how to cook. They're good at that. Uh, we just had a meal here the other night. It was good. And people would come together. They would bring their food. And instead of like we do, we have a common table. And we put our food there. And all people can eat. They can all eat. But in that day, what they were doing is, here's a family, maybe a well-off family. They would bring their baskets of food. They would get their table. They would put their food down, all of their sandwiches, all of their meats, maybe a flagon of wine, and they would get down. They'd sit their family around their table, and they would eat their own food. They wouldn't share. Now, how would you like to be a part of that? If you were a poor member of that church, or maybe if you were a servant, a slave, you, may be look, you, you probably look forward to this because that may have been the only really good meal you got all week. But instead of coming and enjoying, you come and you feel like an outcast in your own church because you don't have a lot to bring. You don't have much. You see, if it's a love feast, shouldn't the brothers and sisters love on one another, and shouldn't it be a time of sharing? Instead, it became a time of showing class status. We got a lot, you don't have little, we're higher, you're lower. You see, the Bible teaches us that in Christ, and you've heard Paul say this many times, there is neither what? Jew or Greek, male or female, bonder or free. We're all one in Christ. You see, in the Roman Empire, the church was the only institution where all people were equal. There were no class distinctions in the church. It was the only place you could go to where there were not class distinctions. You went there, and all were treated alike, equally. And all got to share, because all need the gospel. You may be the richest man in town, but you still need to be born again. You may be the poorest person in town, but you still need to be born again. Being born again is an essential for being in the body of Christ. And so if we're all one body and we all have the same head and we all have the same spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, we all have the same destiny, heaven, if we all have and share in this family, then we need to treat each other like family. And yeah, I know there's dysfunctional families, and that's what Paul was dealing with here. He was dealing with a dysfunctional Christian family. So he's trying to correct some things. So he says in verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. He says, you're calling it the Lord's Supper, but it's not. You see, after the agape feast was over, they would then have what we call communion. First the agape feast, then communion. But Paul says, no, you're all just having your own factional, selfish, little class envy thing going on. He said, I can't, I can't commend you for that. I don't commend you for that. He says, you know what you're doing? In verse 21, he says, you eat your own meal. One goes hungry, and another gets drunk. Can you imagine somebody coming here to church bringing, you know, a 12-pack of Budweiser and getting sloshed? You say, in a church? 
Yeah, in a church. The only thing is they didn't have bud back then. They had flagons of wine. And Paul says they got drunk. It wasn't that they would take a glass of wine and drink it. No, they just, they just kept putting her down. And maybe a poor person over here was getting nothing. He says, you're making a mockery. You call it a love feast. I don't. Now, let me just say that when we partake of the communion cup here, some people have said, well, do you use real wine or grape juice? i tell you why we use grape juice. Now, in the Greek, the word oinos means wine. It can either mean fermented or fresh squeezed. Either way, they would take fresh squeezed right out of the wine press, and they would put it either in terracotta jars to store it because they wanted to be able to drink it all year round, and drinking the wine would be safer than drinking some of the water in that area. Or they would put it in wine skins and store it. Now, wine, as you store it, it's going to do what? It's going to ferment. That's why Jesus said, who takes new wine, puts it in an old wine skin, because the old wine skin is already stretched as far as it's going to stretch. You put the new wine in there over time as the wine ferments. There's no stretch left in the wine skin and it bur burst. So that's why they used a lot of terracotta jars, and they would have big jars of wine that they would drink from all year round after the wine harvest season. Now, some of my friends use the real wine. We don't. Now, why? Well, there's several reasons, but one of the reasons I want you to think with me about is this. When Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, was that freshly squeezed out of his body? It was. You see, decay is the fermenting process. Did Jesus' body decay? No, it did not. His blood was what? Fresh, shed for many. Therefore, when we drink communion, we use grape juice or non-fermented, non-decayed, because it represents more his blood than anything else. Does that make sense to you? Now, I'm going to say, if, you, if the, the people who drink the fermented stuff, I'm not, I'm not going to pick a fight with them or anything like that. But if we go to symbolism, and the Bible is full of symbolism, emblematics, and if you go through Scripture, symbols are important to God. They convey spiritual truths and spiritual messages. That's why we use grape juice because it portrays emblematic the blood of Jesus that was fresh squeezed if you please given and that's why we use it now if another church wants to go another direction that's fine that's up to them but I'm just telling you why we don't I'm not saying you can't have a glass of wine at, at a meal or something like it. I'm not talking about that I'm talking about when we come together for communion does that make sense? Got that? Okay. So he's saying, you've got your meal. You call it a love feast. You bring your food. You don't share it. Not only do you share it, but you just gorge yourself. And some of you just drink yourself silly. You get a buzz on, and you're over there sloshed. Eyes are glazed. Face is red. <clears throat> and you're sitting there saying, we isn't this fun? Well, Paul says, no, you have really messed up. You missed the whole meaning and the purpose. Now look at verse 22. He says, what? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? He says, if you're coming just to eat, 
If that's your purpose is just to get a meal, stay home and eat at home. I know people who have actually thought you shouldn't eat in a church because of this verse. They're against potlucks because of that verse. They're against eating in church because of that verse. That's not what Paul's talking about. He says if the purpose you're coming for is just to eat a meal because you're hungry like you want to go to a restaurant, he says go home, eat at home. He says the purpose of coming together in the agape feast is to love one another and to show that love by sharing, giving. He says, you're not doing that. He says, if that's all it means is just filling your belly, stay home and eat at home. He says, or do you despise the church of God? Wow. Do you despise? There are some people that the church of God is really not much more than the Eagles Club or the Elks Club or some other social club. Not on the same level. Has about the same meaning. He says, you're acting as though the church of God's not important. You're acting here like the pagans act down at their feast when they celebrate their pagan gods. He says, doesn't the church of God mean anything to you? Do you have any affinity for it? Do you understand its purpose? Isn't it something that ought to be revered? He says, no, you despise the church of God by the, your gluttony and your drunkenness, your selfishness. That's not what God's about, so why are you who claim to represent God, acting in a way that is contrary to God. He says, you humiliate those who have nothing. Can you imagine some poor person coming in, doesn't even have enough at home hardly to feed their family. They come into the church, they stand around, they look around, where am I going to seat? I can't sit here because they've got that all taken care of and they're loaded with food there. He or she may find a table, sit down, but there's nothing to eat. They feel humiliated. Should anybody feel humiliated in the house of God? No, they should not. They need to feel what? Welcomed, loved, appreciated, because they bear the image of Christ the same as you. They are part of God's creation, the same as you. Matters not their social status, their skin color, their culture, whatever. They are the same as you. They need to be shown the love of Christ. And so he says, you've humiliated those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you? No, I will not. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine how the guy who stood up and said, I have a letter from the Apostle Paul. Everybody listen. Can you imagine how the church at Corinth must have felt as he was reading that letter? The church at Corinth, probably the people there in his pews squirmed a little, I would imagine. And so he's going to talk about communion as far as its purpose. Now, some of, my, uh, some of my friends in the Catholic Church, they believe that when you partake of the bread and the wine, they have a doctrine they call transubstantiation. Now, transubstantiation, they actually believe that the bread and wine turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that would get them in trouble because a lot of the enemies of the church believed they were practicing some form of cannibal, cannibalism since they said it actually turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It was a substantive change, so they call it transubstantiation. And uh, I'm not into that. I'm not, I don't think that's what Paul meant. There are others, like Martin Luther, great reformer who believed in consubstantiation he believed that 
while they didn't physically turn into the body and blood of Christ, the elements, they did have the body and blood in them. So even though they still tasted like bread, tasted like wine, it was still transformed into the presence of Christ. John Calvin, he was a fellow who believed that there is a spiritual presence and a spiritual union. So the spiritual union was in the elements. And then there was the guy that most of us follow. His name was Ulrich Zwingli. He was a Swiss reformer, and he taught that the elements are emblematic. They symbolize, they represent, and that's all they are, is emblematic of the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. That's who we are today. In other words, the elements point to a living sermon that remind us of what Jesus did on the cross, nothing less and certainly nothing more than that. So those are some of the views about that. That may be more information than you wanted to know, but there it is. didn't cost you a thing. Okay? Now, um, there, when we take of communion, there are four looks. If you want to write these down, you can, because we're going to be taking communion here in a few minutes. But there are four looks when we partake of communion. Number one, we are looking backwards. That's the backward look. In other words, what we're recalling is in the past, 2,000 years ago, Jesus literally died for us. He was beaten, crucified, died on that cross. A spear was thrust into his side, into the pericardial sac. He was dead. He died. That was a backward look. We recall what Jesus did for us. We are remembering the sacrifice. That's why you'll see on some communion tables the phrase, this do in what? Remembrance of me. That's the backward look. You know, it's interesting that Christ never said, I want you to build a, a big church over all of the places I was. Build a big church over the, where the Sermon on the Mount was. Build a big church over uh, where I died. Build a big church or mausoleum or whatever. The only thing he ever asked that we have by way of remembrance was not some big ornate building, but he did ask that we remember him in the elements of communion, and we do. Number two, there's the present look. The Scripture says here in verse 24, this is my body. This is my body, which is for you. The word is there is present tense. So there's the present look. When we take communion in a few moments, you're going to be not only remembering in the past, but you are also thankful that you have this currently covenant relationship with God through faith in him. So it is a present. You know, here's the thing. Let me ask you this question. How many of you remember the day you got saved? You remember that. I've had people tell me, wow, you know, I remember the day I gave my heart to Christ. I remember the peace I felt. I remember the burden of sin that rolled off my back. I felt as light as a feather, free as a bird. And I thought, man, this is fantastic. I know now my sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven. Jesus has done it all. They are so excited about it. That's great, wonderful. But let me ask you, Where's your life today? Are you still excited about that? Does it still thrill you? Do you still enjoy reading the Bible? Do you still enjoy coming to church? Do you still enjoy fellowshipping with the saints? Do you still look forward to heaven? You see, it is a present relationship. Not just something that happened in the past, but praise God for that, but it is something that is still ongoing today. It may have matured, it may have changed, 
but it's still real. So it's a present relationship. Then number three, it's a future relationship. It's a future look. Notice what he says in verse 26. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are re proclaiming the Lord's death for how long? Until he comes. How many of you are excited and looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ? Man, don't, doesn't our world need him right now? Does, doesn't right now our world situation cry out, Christ, we need you. We can't fix this. Come back, Lord. Straighten out this mess. Bring peace where there's war. Bring harmony where there's discord. Bring unity where there's division. And Jesus made a promise. He said, if I go away, I will what? I will come again. Does Jesus lie? No. Is he coming back? So many times in Scripture, so many times he promised, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So Jesus says, I'm coming back. And we are to celebrate communion and remember his death until he returns. That's what we proclaim, the death, burial, and resurrection until he comes back. We're not, you know, up here reading the local newspaper, giving a book report from some book. You know, that's not our calling as good as those things may be in their place, this is not the place. In this place, we need to prepare people for eternity. How many think you're going to die someday if Jesus doesn't return in your lifetime? Last I checked, death was batting a thousand. You see, our job is to prepare you for that moment, that day, that time when you take your last breath. You know, we received the sad news that one of the famous gospel families died many, I think it was, what, seven people died in a plane crash. Three of them from the one family, the Neyland family. I mean, you know, when they got on that plane and took off for Seattle, they had plans to join the Gaithers on a cruise, Alaskan cruise or wherever. They were excited. They were looking forward to ministry. They were looking forward to all of that. Never made it. The Bible tells us to number our days. In other words, realize that we have a number. Our days are numbered. The issue there is not to be afraid of that. The issue there isn't to be in dread of that. The issue there is to be prepared for that. How do I prepare? I repair, I'm prepared when I trust the author of life, the giver of life. I trust him to be my life, Jesus Christ inside. That's my eternal life. And so it happens. And so he takes us back to the Passover feast, and we talked about that the other day, and he took the bread. He said, this is my body. He broke it, and his body was broken. And he said, this is my body, present tense, which is for you. It is for you. The beating he took was for you. The humiliation he took was for you. The spittle on his face was for you. Having his beard plucked out was for you. Having the stripes and the lashes laid on his back was for you. Having to endure in a pain like few of us ever will, it was for you. The nails driven at his feet and hands, it was for you. 
his death on the cross. It was for you. Isaiah the prophet said this way, it is by his stripes that we are what? Healed. It was for you. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup, said this is the cup of the new covenant, and this is what he's instituting that night when he was celebrating Passover. He transformed the Passover feast into a new covenant feast. It's a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes, and we are. We believe he's coming again. Verse 27, wherefore? Therefore, eat the bread and drinks of the cup. If you eat it or drink it, he says, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself. Then... And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, some people get this all boogered up. They, they miss the meaning here. Some people say, well, I'm not worthy, so I'm not going to partake. How many of you feel worthy to be saved? You know, none of us are. Do you feel worthy of the death of Christ for you? Do you feel worthy that he should lay down his life for you? Do you feel worthy that God the Father would send his son for you? None of us feel, none of us are worthy of that. But when Christ died for us, saved us, forgave us, washed away our sins, guess what? He made us worthy. He made us worthy. So when it comes to communion, what Paul is saying is not, do I feel worthy to partake of communion? Because if that was the case, we all would just pass. He says, examine yourself. Look inside. Anything that needs to be repented of, any unconfessed sin, do a spiritual inventory. He says, and then what? He says, and then so eat. And so eat. First examine, then eat. That's what he's saying. He's saying don't eat because you don't feel worthy. He's saying what? Examine, confess, and then eat. Eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He says, but be careful that you don't eat it in an unworthy manner. Not that you're unworthy, but how you partake of communion. Let it be done in a worthy manner. See, what was happening is in the agape feast, they were not discerning the Lord's body. They were just having a good old time. They were not sharing. They were not demonstrating love. They were being selfish, gluttonous, drunkards. He says, you're making a, mo a mockery of this beautiful symbol this beautiful symbol. Now, God takes his symbols very, very serious. You remember Moses in the wilderness? They needed water. God said, go to this rock, strike it. When he did, what came out? Enough water for everybody. Enough water for everybody. Later on, they would be in a similar situation and God says, go to this rock and speak to the rock. Moses, by this time, he'd had it up to here with all the griping, complaining, and belly aching. He was so mad at the people because they were just always griping and fussing, always complaining, always wanting to go back to Egypt. And in his anger, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it again. God gave water, but God said to Moses, in your anger and your disobedience, you will not enter the land of promise. God, you see, Moses had ruined a type. 
The rock is Christ. Christ was struck how many times for our sins? Only once. How many times did he die for our sins? Only once. Now, as children of God, if we want to deal with our sin as children of God, we speak to the rock. We speak to Christ. We ask him to forgive us and save us. And the water of his word and the promises of his word wash us clean again. He's promised to do that. He doesn't need to be struck again and again and again. Only once. Once is enough to save you. Okay, now let me, let me hurry and finish this up. There's just so much here. Goodness gracious. So let a person examine himself, dokamizo, to examine, to really look seriously and so eat. Now, verse 29 says, For if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment, not condemnation, judgment upon himself. Verse 30, he says, This is why many, not a few, how many? M-A-N-Y. Many of you are weak and ill, and even some of you have died. Wow. Do you think God takes his symbols Serious? He said, many are sick, weak, and some have even died because of their selfish acts. They have made a mockery of my symbol. And because they've made a mockery of it, God has sent judgment, not condemnation, but judgment. You see, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, what did they do? They lied to Peter. They lied about their status. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And they were judged. They died. Now, I believe they went to heaven, but they died nonetheless. These people here in Corinth, they died, some of them. Now, they probably went to heaven. They experienced judgment, but they didn't experience condemnation. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so they experienced judgment. Now, verse 32 is interesting. Verse 31 says that if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't need to be judged. In other words, if we would confess our sins, get our lives back right, repent, then God doesn't need to. God always gives us the first opportunity to deal with sin in our lives. And usually he's very patient with that. Sometimes his patience may go for years. And God is saying, I'm giving you time. I'm giving you the first opportunity. Repent, change, confess. If you don't, then I'll have to step in and bring judgment. Not condemnation, but judgment. And he says in verse 32, something that really proves that these people were saved. <clears throat> he says, but when we are judged by the Lord, that is when we're disciplined, okay, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. The fact that they were being disciplined proves they belong to God. He says, if God doesn't discipline you, that means you belong to the world and you'll be condemned with the world. But the fact that you're being disciplined by God is proof that you belong to him. You see, people get these verses all screwed up and may have all kinds of weird doctrines. But this is what he's saying here. He says, so brothers, when you come together, wait for one another. In other words, just share and help each other out. He says, if anyone is physically hungry, let him eat at home. If that's all you want is a meal, stay home. So that when you come together, it is not for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. Wouldn't you have loved to known what the other things were? Wouldn't you have liked to have read his thoughts on the other things? He says, when I get there, there's other things I'm just going to deal with when I get there. I would, I'm, my curiosity is saying, what, what, what? If it was that important, I'm sure the Lord would have had him to write it down. Well, folks, we're getting ready now to partake of communion. Here's what I want us to do. I want you to do a time of examination.
while our ushers are getting in place and they're getting the elements and they're going to come and take their station as we often do here. But while they're doing that, just take a moment, look within, and the Holy Spirit will bring up whatever needs to be repented of, whatever needs to be confessed. This is a great time to do that inner cleansing. Here, it's also a great time if anybody's here who has never received Christ. Wow, this is the time right now. Make that decision in your own heart. Turn your life over to him. Call upon him. Make him Lord of your life. You'll never regret that. The ushers are going to get in their stations, and when they do, here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to have you all stand. Everybody's going to go to your It'd be your left, okay? You move to your left to the nearest aisle. So this section will move to that aisle. This section will move to that aisle. You just move to your left. Take the elements. Move back to your seat. And then when you're ready, you take the bread, take the cup. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time of communion. You said, do this in remembrance of me. We do remember. Lord, we remember your love that was so great that you came knowing that you would die. You willingly accepted that in order that we would be able to live with you forever and ever and ever in heaven with our loved ones. Father, thank you for so great a gift of salvation. The world today is filled with philosophies, filled with thoughts, filled with religions, and yet, Father, you told us that it was through your Son you chose to save the world. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the resurrection that proves death is not the final outcome. That there is life, life, life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Everybody standing. While we're standing, go ahead and start making your way to the aisle there to your left and just take the elements. <laughs>
scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes.